Welcome to Bible study. This is the Bible study prepared for Faithful Savior and St. Michael's Lutheran Churches. And this one is intended for March 26th, the fifth Sunday uh, in Lent in 2023. Uh, we'll be reading the amazing story of uh, John's <coughs> or of Jesus' uh, raising of Lazarus this Sunday. So you may want to uh, brush up on that uh, before you come to church. But for this Bible study, we're going to be in John chapter 15, uh, several chapters after that. But we want to keep in mind that raising of Lazarus story a little bit. In fact, we really, for this chapter, want to keep in mind several of the major themes that have been running through uh, the gospel according to John. And all of them need to fall under the rubric or under the, the master thematic guide of those amazing words at the end of chapter 20. And so if you got your text, before you go to 15, I would have you maybe go to chapter 20. And this is, of course, the resurrection chapter in John. Uh, it's also the story where we get the story of doubting Thomas, uh, who touches the wounds of Christ. But at the end, we get these two little verses that John uh, does sort of a, a summary, a summation of what, what, is, uh, what, what he's been talking about. And in there he says, you know, Jesus did a lot of miracles that I didn't tell you about, a lot of signs that are not in this book. But these are included that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the purpose statement for the entire gospel according to John. This is why he wrote the book. This is what he wants these words to do to you. He wants them to give you faith in Jesus Christ. We need to remember, as I have said before, that our English language betrays us a little bit here. We don't have actually a verbal form of faith. We, we use another word called believe, but that word carries with it all kinds of connotations of intellectual assent that are not really native to the word faith and or the verbal form, which would be something like to faith. But John has been helping us and I want to read this chapter really as a way of John helping us to understand what he means when he says, these have been written so that you would faith, believe in Jesus Christ. So what is faith? And I've, I've said this many times before, but when I go and ask that question in congregations and in my classrooms as I teach, I'm usually met with a kind of embarrassed puzzlement as people just simply think they know what it is, but they don't have a definition. They can't tell me what it is. They can't really articulate it. John has been giving us a vocabulary all along to talk about what faith is. And be aware, he is, he is really disabusing you of the notion that it is this intellectual assent that you and I normally associate with belief. It is much deeper than that. It is much more important to the person than that. I mean, I can intellectually assent to all kinds of things without ever having seen them, and we call that, I believe that. No, this is much bigger and deeper than that. Just consider the many metaphors that Jesus has used. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the light. So faith is living in that light, is letting Jesus interpret and give you understanding of the world around you. To say that you believe and you faith in Jesus is to say that he is the bread of life. And in the ancient world, the bread was the thing that brought all the food to you. So he is, the, he is the sustenance of your life. To say that to believe in Jesus is to say is, he is the water of life. He washes us. He sustains our life. He, he is the very matrix from which we are born. I mean, we speak of 
A baby's ready to be born when a woman's water has broken. Jesus has said that he is the shepherd who guides and protects and watches over us. And I then am his sheep. I am his, a member of his flock. Today, we're going to get another one of those metaphor words, and it's going to simply give us another way of looking at this. Think of all of these different metaphors about faith as being <clears throat> maybe looking at a different facet of a multifaceted gem. Uh, they're each different and, and each in their own way, but they're not whole. They're not complete. There's always more one could say than the metaphor, but the metaphor allows us to talk about this deep, mysterious thing that, that we have a hard time articulating. So when somebody says, what is faith? You might say, faith is when it's believing in Jesus. Faithing in Jesus is when he is my shepherd, he is my light, he is, my, he is the water of my life, he is the food of my life, he's the bread of life, he is he's everything. And today we get a new one. I am the true vine, he says in chapter 15. And my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. A number of years ago, I had a dear friend, we were talking about this very passage, and he happened to uh, uh, be uh, part of a family that owned and operated a large vineyard in Napa, in, or, sorry, in, in uh, Sonoma County, down in California. Uh, and they, they not only raised the grapes, but they also made the wine. They were both viticulturalists and vintners, is the word. And he explained this passage to me in a really interesting, he gave me some really interesting insights to this. Um, the word they still use after they have pruned the vines. If you go driving down in the Willamette Valley and you see all, the, all those, those uh, uh, vineyards and you'll see them this time of year, they've just been shaved. The word they still use for that is they're clean. He says that if you do not do that on an annual basis, the grapevines will just keep growing and they'll get so far away from the root, they cannot produce any fruit. They have to be cleaned every year. Otherwise, they will not produce. Jesus is using accurate and technical language to describe this relationship that you and I have. He likens it to a vine and a vine dresser. We are the branches of that vine. Jesus is the vine root, okay, that stem. When you go driving by, you'll see a, you'll see a vine set into the ground, it's growing in the ground. But what they do is they actually graft in the branch that produces the fruit. It's very interesting. If you have, a, if you have a, uh, an entire vineyard that is producing Merlot grapes, and all of a sudden the market changes and Merlot is no longer uh, the moneymaker that it once was, you cut all those off, you regraft in Pinot, Pinot Noir, and in a year or two, that's all growing Pinot Noir instead. It's a fascinating process. If you ever get a chance to do a tour of a vineyard, I encourage you to do it. It'll really help you read this passage. He's the true vine. He's that rootstock. My father is the vine dresser, the vine grower. He removes a branch in me that bears no fruit, cuts it off. Then every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it doesn't get out of, out of so far away. You have already been cleansed. All right, so Jesus is saying, he's already done the pruning on you. You are a fruitful branch already. Abide in me as I abide in you. Be stuck to that root. Be inserted, grafted in, so that you can bear fruit. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, if you cut off one of those branches, and they do that every year, you'll see it. They just take them out and burn them. They just lay on the ground and they haul them off 
and they're, they're, they're destroyed. Neither can you bear any fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch, withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Now, you know, we have this, this interesting question that shows up in a number of places. Ask God anything and he'll do it for you. But those are, asked, those are always questions or requests made in faith. All right? It's that old sinner in me that says, well, that means I can ask for the sports car and get it, right? That isn't quite what Jesus means here. My Father is glorified that you become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. Simply be the people whom I love. If you keep my commands, or remember this is, we had this last time, since you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that your joy may be in, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete or fulfilled. Well, then he goes on to tell us, well, what's the command? This is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved us? No one has greater love than this. That is to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. And there it is. Now. God gets to define what love is. Not necessarily the same thing you see on the signs in people's yards in in my neighborhood. And not the same thing that our culture has defined love as today. But notice, it is not (coughs) keep all the commandments. It is not, you know, be perfect in some, you know, moral, ethical way. It is love. Love one another. Therein, and for John, that's a very physical, real thing. It's a thing that it finds expression in deed, in, in the words we speak to one another, in the actions we take with one another, in, in, in very real things. Love one another. He also says something else there that's very interesting. Is he calls us friends. Um, I've spoken about this before, but this is actually a very important word. Um, we live in a time and place where you know Facebook has friends, and so you have people that you have clicked a box and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to somehow be, be digitally connected to them. That is not at all what Jesus has in mind. Um, the ancient Roman world valued friendship in a different way. Usually a person would only have maybe two or three, at most five, friends. They would, they would be the people that always had your back. Everybody outside that tiny little circle was perhaps an ally. Uh, they might even be a persistent client of yours, but they were never really given that title, friend, amicus in Latin. You could always count on a friend. That other person, if it got to be advantageous, might turn their back on you, might ally with somebody else, might betray you. And, and you would think that was normal. 
They would do that for their own sake. And you understood that about that relationship. Every aspect of that relationship was effectively commodified. This is one of the things that makes the early Christian community very different in Roman society. It's not so much what they believe as it is the way they treat each other. They treat each other as if that circle of people you absolutely count on has suddenly expanded to include hundreds, thousands of people. The Romans could not get their mind around this. This is, in fact, why uh, Roman persecutions oftentimes broke out against the Christians, because they were acting so strange. And in fact, the Romans mapped onto that, this idea that, well, maybe they're not actually friends, maybe they are allies in a plot to overthrow the government. And this is their code language. That's why persecutions broke out. But Jesus really meant it. Treat one another as friends. Never betray one another. Always take them in. Always show hospitality to them. Love them. It's also why Christian communities regularly use the term brother and sister to refer to people well outside their, their normal you know, familial relationships. Those congregations, those communities of people, became radical witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not by always what they said to the outside world or the sign they put on the outside of their church, which they never did, uh, or even by putting a cross on top of it. They became radical witnesses to the, to the resurrection of Jesus by living in a different relationship with the people inside that congregation, different from the way the rest of the world treated them. I believe we're coming to a time and a place when those distinctions may be made again. I mean, when I grew up, when many of us were born and, and raised in this country, the distinction between being an American and a Christian was pretty slight. It was there, but it wasn't that big. But it's becoming increasingly divergent that the values and the imperatives that drive our Christian lives, the sustenance we derive from the true vine that bears this particular fruit, this Pinot Noir of Christianity, is different than that which is out in the world. I look forward to talking more with you about this. We'll pick it up there uh, and just talk about this image on Sunday if you want to come to the 8.30 class at St. Michael's. God bless you. We'll see you soon.